Here we go. So here's my top 10 tips. Um, I'm going to work my way through these in a project I'm working on, on on a separate screen over here. So what I'll do is I'll start at the top and I'll introduce each section, give a bit of an explanation, and then I'll get into showing you how to do these tips. So firstly, we've got arranging visual elements. So a lot of people may not be aware that there are actually several handy options for laying out your visual elements, using the layer functions, stuff like that, that that isn't immediately obvious but can actually be very handy. So here is a project I've made earlier. Uh, so it's currently blank and by the end of this hopefully it'll be a full project that I can share with you all. So what I'm going to do actually, uh, I just want to make a couple of buttons at the top of the screen. So we'll have a text box and a rectangle. And I'm actually going to just keep them at 100 width. Let's set the height to 40. So here we go. There you go. So the first thing I want to show you is the align elements function. So by right clicking on one of these visual elements, after selecting more than one, you can actually align them. So you could align by the bottom of them, the center, the horizontal center. Yeah, it's worth playing around with these, these different functions so you know what they do. In this case, I want to align them in the center just to put them on top of each other. So I could have typed in the X and Y coordinates manually, but that's just a nice, easy way of doing things. Oh, I should mention as well, if you have any questions throughout, please feel free to enter them. There should be a question box somewhere on your screen. Uh, if you just enter any questions, we have several members of staff who are happy to help out. So, and also I can answer any questions on air if, you, if you'd rather as well. So please feel free to ask questions. Okay. So next up, what I'm going to do is just center this text and call it button one. So the next thing I want to do is just create a couple of these. I want three buttons, for example. So I have now got three of these items. And can I just change the text on them? Here we go. So the next tool I want to show you uh, in a second is the grouping tool. So grouping will allow us to merge several visual elements into one item. So this won't take into effect shapes in general. It'll make one giant square as the bounding rectangle of the element. But for things like buttons, it's very handy. It means you can just click and drag that one element. Uh, the, the button presses can refer to that one element. And so what I want to do is just position that one at the top left and this one here at the top right. And so the next thing I'm going to show you is the... So first I can just align these. So if I align them vertical center, there you go. And um, what I want to do now is distribute these buttons evenly so that there's a, an even gap between button one and button two and button two and button three. And this distribute horizontally function will become available if I select multiple elements that are in the same plane. So here we go, I do that. And now you'll see that this gap is now equal to this gap. This applies to numerous elements. And what it'll do is it'll apply in the order that the elements were selected. So I could, instead of dragging, I could have selected and hold control. I could select more elements and then repeat the distribute horizontally function. So that's just a nice handy way. There's a distribute vertical function as well. So that's just a handy way of laying out your elements on screen in a tidy way. Okay, uh, so the final thing that I want to review when it comes to visual elements is layers. So layers are something that a lot of people don't think about in smaller projects. When it comes to having a lot of elements on screen, you're going to need to use layers. So the way to think about these layers is that the highest number will always be on top. If they have the same number, then the last element changed or added to the scene will go on top, theoretically. But there's always the chance that that won't happen as you'd expect it to. And so I would really recommend that throughout you keep your layers consistent. So in this case, I know I'm going to have a background image underneath this, which is going to be on layer zero. So I want all of these buttons to be layer one. 
So something else that it's worth noting is that when you select multiple elements, any of their common properties will be shown in this property editor. And so by doing this, I've now changed the layer for all three of these buttons in one go. So that's it for our first tip, arranging visual elements. Next, I am going to go on to naming. So naming, it sounds obvious. Uh, it sounds like something that everyone should, should do, but it, to be honest, from experience, I, I'm very lazy when it comes to naming normally, but for a big project, for any project really, you really need to think about your naming scheme. So in this case, the way I tend to do it is I tend to start with whatever the item type is so that all my items of a specific type are linked together. Obviously, these uh, elements are listed in alphabetical order. So if I have the first section of a name the same, then they're all going to appear together in my list of elements. So for this, it's a group element, so I'm going to call it group. And this is button one. So I've got the type of element followed by an underscore. Now I use uh, underscores. A lot of people use capitals to separate different words. You can use whatever method you like as long as you use a method that you stick to. So here we go. We've got group and group on three. Okay. So that's... Uh, as, and you'll see as I progress throughout this, I'll, I'll keep my naming scheme consistent and hopefully that means when you come to download the project at a later date, you can see a lot easier where all of the elements are and it means when I come back to this project at a later date, hopefully I understand what's going on just by the names of the elements. Uh, fortunately, as we'll discuss later, there are some other ways to work out what's going on. but naming is by far the best way to keep it simple and consistent. Okay, so next I'm going to work on some invisible click areas. Now, I know in the initial V1 software, I believe you could click on invisible elements. Now, that doesn't seem right. You shouldn't be able to click on something that's visibility is set to false, because otherwise how can you have buttons come on top of other buttons? It, it wouldn't work very well. So we removed that feature and anything that's not visible is not there on the screen to be clicked. However, we're aware that you want these invisible areas to be able to be clicked. And so what I've got is a, is a way of doing that. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add a background to this screen. So bear with me one moment and I will just import the image. Here we go. So I've just uh, dragged in this image. And what I want to do is resize it and reposition it. 480 by 272. There we go. So this is now the same size as the screen. It's put it on layer 0, which is where I wanted it. And you'll see that even though it was added later, it's gone underneath those buttons. So what I'll now do is I'll rename that. So it's an image and it's the background. OK. Another handy tip when you're dealing with these layers, so what you'll find is if I select multiple things like that, I've now accidentally selected the background. That's not something I really want to do. So you'll see these ticks down the left-hand side of the visual elements, and what I can actually do is untick that background. So it's still there, but it's not enabled for selection. So now I can select all my buttons, and my, my background image isn't selected. I can mess around with what I like nice and simply. OK. So, the next step, I want to add an invisible button over this arrow here. So, a lot of people will want to have uh, several buttons built into their background images because they don't want to chop and, chop and select different bits of their background image. They want to just put one image on and then have buttons all over that image. So, what I'm going to do is use this rectangle as my selection area for that triangle. So here we go. I'm just going to roughly position it here. I'm not going to be too accurate. Um, I'm a bit picky with these things though. So there we go. So what we'll do is now change the alpha property of the color. So the alpha channel, what you see on the color is you've got 
one byte, well, you've got four bytes. You've got alpha, R, G, and B. So your alpha channel is your transparency, red, green, and blue values. If you hover over, you'll see what those are. And what I'm going to do is just set that alpha value to zero. And what that leaves us with is an effectively transparent rectangle that is still technically visible. So what I actually want, I'm going to just change the layer of that just to be on the safe side. It, it's not visible, so it shouldn't matter, but I think it's important to keep these things consistent. And so this is going to be a rectangle, and this is our next arrow. Okay, so here we have our invisible button, but we have to actually add the button element to it. So what I'm going to do is just drag in this button. Now I quite like the name button as a description, and this is our right uh, next arrow. So when I link elements together, I try and keep them consistent. So you'll notice my rect is next arrow, and my button is next arrow. So I can see that there's a distinct link between those two elements. And so what I'm going to do is link the visual element to this button. So this button is now linked to this rectangle. And what I can do is create an action load screen and this is the next arrow, so it's going to take us to the next screen. So I'll just quickly add in a new screen. Here we go. Now, I think it's probably best to name the screens, but I'm just going to stick with a simple screen one and screen two. I don't like it when it doesn't have a number next to it, though, because it could go anywhere. So we're going to link this screen loader here to screen two. So when that's called, we're going to move to our next screen. And we want it to be called when this arrow is pressed. Okay, and so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run that through on the emulator for you. Oh, and you'll notice I haven't put a visual element into screen two. It's a, a message that annoys me, but it's necessary. So here we go. So we can run that. And if I press anywhere on the screen, nothing happens. And if I go for this arrow here, you'll notice the button is pressed. We go through to the next screen without any problems. So there we have invisible click areas, okay? So the next thing I'd like to talk about is Boolean builders to update digital states. So this isn't immediately obvious what, what I'm going to talk about. It's a bit of a random one, but it's something that I've found in a lot of large projects actually makes a very large difference. So the main thing in large projects is the sheer number of elements. It can become a bit overwhelming. And so I, I look for ways to minimize the number of elements I'm using. And initially, when I wanted some alarm states, some custom alarm states, so I know you can use these alarm elements here. In more complicated projects, I tend not to use those. I tend to do it manually using a timer to check values and then update alarm states. So what I'm going to do quickly is just add two alarm outputs. And this is going to be the high alarm. And this is going to be the low alarm. OK. And so both of those are going to default to the off state. And I'm also going to add one analog input. So this is our analog. In fact, I'm going to add two analog inputs. And you'll see why when I get onto the later state. So analog, and this is going to be in one. And the same for the second one. Now, in the eventuality that we're using the dev board, I would normally set the range to minus 10, uh, to minus 5, to plus 5. But in this case, the emulator defaults to 0 to 10. So I'm just going to use 0 to 10 on these. OK. So we've got all our hardware elements added. That's something else I like to do. I like to sort the visual. I like to then sort the hardware. And then I'll put all the function elements that link those together. So what I'm going to do is set these alarms based on the level of analog input 1 in this case. So what I'll also do is add some variables to control where those levels are. So I'll have number high alarm. Here we go. There we go. Uh, and these high alarms are going to be at 5 volts, 
No, actually I'm going to put them at 7 volts. And the low alarm is going to be at 3 volts. Okay. Uh, so what I'm going to do to implement this, so normally what I would do is I would have a timer which calls a, a logic builder which determines whether it's high and then I would have a timer which calls another logic builder which determines whether it's low. But what we can actually do is use the boolean builder and what I can do here, so I tend to call my boolean builders is and then a question just because that's what it does, it determines whether a state is true or a logic statement is true. So I'm going to call it is high alarm and I've put an extra capital L in there. And likewise is low alarm. So now these are very handy, so I can put any number of logic checks in this, and it, ORD, X ORD, however I want to do it, to determine whether these alarm outputs should be on or should be off. And so what I'm going to do, so in this case, because the analog in one is used for both alarm outputs, you could argue that one logic builder could do both of those checks. However, if it were two separate alarms that weren't invariably linked, such as a high value or a low value, then you would need to have two separate logic builders to check those, which is why I prefer to use this boolean builder approach. So what I can do then is create one action which will specify what those alarm outputs should be. So here I can select the values of the alarms to directly set them. Sorry. Here we go. So and I want to set those alarm values equal to my is alarm one, for example. So is high alarm will go to the alarm. Here we go. So this one is our low alarm. Perfect. So what we'll need now is the logic statements behind these. So is low alarm is going to be true if our analog input one, where are you? Analog in one dot voltage is less than. Um, I'm not going to do less than or equal to, and that's going to be our low alarm variable. So something you'll see is that when I'm looking to select all these elements, I've got a good idea of what each one of them is just by looking at the name. That's just reinforcing that point that naming is very key throughout this. Otherwise, I would be looking through, is it button one, rectangle one, rectangle two? It gets very messy. So another thing I could do and it just speeds things up a bit, is copying and pasting. It sounds silly, but you, some things you can copy, some things you can't. Equations, copy and paste the sections you want, it helps a lot. So here, the only thing, I mean, they're all different, but it's just, uh, in fact, no, that was the same. So, and I'll get my voltage, and then I'm just changing this variable here, and this has to be greater than. Okay, so there we go. We've got our logic statements, we've got our action, which sets the alarms. So this action when called will set the alarms equal to whatever they should be based on those logic checks. Okay, so what I'm going to do is now call that action at a regular interval. So I could do this based on a property trigger. Uh, what I prefer is when it comes to analog inputs, I prefer to manually set the refresh rate or the check rate. So you could use a property trigger, but it runs a lot more and it uses a lot more processing power and it tends to be that it just looks like it's flickering. If you're displaying a value, it, it doesn't look as nice. I, I think it's nicer if you say every half a second, update that value. So I tend to use a timer for analog devices. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to check that alarm output every 100 milliseconds because I do want it to be relatively responsive. and simply going to call this action set alarms and I would like it to run immediately when the screen turns on. So this is our timer underscore set alarms. So again we can see that this timer is linked to this action and then looking we can see that we're checking our values and we're setting them. Okay, so there we have it. Let's just test that one now then. 
Here we go. So it's linked to analog input one. Let me just bring in our alarm outputs for you. Uh, just one second. Here we go. So you can see we've got the alarm output on. As it moves, it's turning on and off as we'd expect. Okay. So there you have it. The next section. So that that was Boolean builders to update digital states. Next thing I want to look at is templates. So templates are very helpful. So what, what you'll find quite quite often is that a lot of screens will have a lot of similar features or in one project you'll think, oh, this bar graph I've created with all these elements is really nice. I'd like to use that in other projects in the future. And the best way to do that is through the use of templates. So what I can do is I can select any number of elements, visual, functional, or hardware, and I can actually create a template of those. So for example, I like this layout on the screen. Uh, in fact, I'm going to select it down here just to ensure. So you can deselect items by holding control and clicking on them. So I've selected all of these visual elements. I, I want these on my second screen. I think I might want them on a third screen. I, I don't know, but I like how they look. Um, and the other things I'm going to want are this arrow button here, which I'll want the functional part of that. And I'll probably also want the screen loader part of that. Now, am I interested in the alarms and the analog on the other page? I think I will want the analog inputs, so I'm going to keep those as part of my uh, template as well. So let me just save that as template, so I can right click on it, save as template, and here you go. So it's added a template to this user defined section at the bottom. It's worth noting that that section isn't actually visible until you have some user defined templates. So if you're wondering why you can't see it, that's why. Now it's also possible to import other people's templates. So if, if your colleague has come up with a, a great way of laying something out on the screen and a combination of maths builders and actions, so for example, someone's come up with a thermocouple maths builder series of elements and you want to share that with your colleague, you can actually right click and export your template and then similarly right click and import someone else's template. So that's just a really handy way of sharing clever, clever little things you've done for example, we can come up with some templates if, if people ask for them and, and we can send them out to you as a template, nice and easy to add to a project. So yeah, what you probably want to do first is rename the template. So this is going to be my template. Now this is, oh, let's call it template backdrop. Okay, and what I'll do is I'll quickly come over to this screen. I can get rid of this placeholder rectangle now and I can actually just add that there. So bang, it's all gone in exactly as it was on the previous screen, which causes us a slight problem in that this screen loader can't point to itself. Well, it can, but it doesn't know what you wanted, so it's going to go back to its default state and ask again. And actually what I want to do is loop it back around to screen one. So what we'll see now, if I run this straight away, is that actually we've got well, you may not see a lot. The one thing you'll notice is that the alarms won't work on the second screen yet because I didn't copy them across. So that's how we'll check that it's changed screen. But when I click that, we can see that the alarms are turned off and it's gone to its second screen. And it looks exactly like the first one, exactly what we wanted from our template. So I'll probably want to put a, a screen identifier on there somewhere. I'm, I'm going to add stuff to it, so it'll be obvious later. Uh, but then I can click the button again, and that's cycled back. You'll see that the alarms come back on. We're back on screen one. So as you can see, the template functions as it did, and also the screen looks as it did when I copied it as well. So that's just a very handy way of creating similar objects on multiple pages uh, or, or creating templates that you can share with friends and, and colleagues, etc. So that's it for, for templates. So next what we're going to do is we're going to look at variables. So in my opinion, variables are a great way of sharing things across multiple screens and primarily that's what they're used for. Now there is the ability to also have persistent variables so you may want stuff stored even if it's only on one screen. So as I showed you earlier the variables tab is just up here on the top left of your design studio. Pardon me. 
Um, and you can have several types of variables, boolean, color, number, string. Now, the most commonly used is probably number. Uh, if you're incrementing a value and you want to, to save it when the device is turned off, or you're counting a number of pulses and you want that count to continue while you're on another screen. So one, one thing you'll notice is that any maths builder values, any, any values that aren't stored as a variable will disappear when you change screens. So that's, that's why we have our variables and it's very important to use those. So what I'm going to do now is talk to you about how you set up those variables when you change screens. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually make use of these buttons I created earlier by having a text box which displays which button was last pressed. Okay, so here we have our text box and I'm going to set it to zero by default because no buttons have been pressed. Um, right, I'm happy with the size. I'm not going to fuss too much about the formatting of it. But what I'm going to do is name it. So this is our text state. And we're going to have a variable that's a number called number state. OK, and that's defaulting to zero, much like the text. So what I need to do now is add a button for each of these button visual elements. So we'll have three button elements. We've got button underscore one. So you'll notice that my naming scheme have, has deviated slightly. So these buttons are linked to these buttons over here, which are group button one. Because these are buttons, and my identifier, that I, I wouldn't want to have button underscore button one, that would be pointless. So I've just gone with this simpler, simpler naming here. As long as it gets the right idea across, that's fine. So I'll proceed with this then. So I'm going to just link these up to the appropriate visual elements. So button two links to group button two. And likewise, button three. OK. And what I'll need now is an action for each of those buttons. And what that's going to do is it's going to update both the variable and it's going to update the text. So here we go. One, two, three. So set state one. And what I tend to do with actions is think about it beforehand and I'm going to set first of all the state and then I'm going to set the text just because I prefer to have anything that could be used in further computation first before anything visual. That's just a personal preference though. So what I'll do is I'm going to set the variable number state equal to, and this is set state one, so we're going to set this equal to the value of one and then we're going to update <coughs> our text box just to display that value and we're going to update the text property to one without a new line. Okay, and so I know I've already created all of these actions but what I'm actually going to do is delete them and copy this one. So what I can do then is paste it in and you'll notice the numbering is all that changes so if it ends with a number it's just going to increment that number so they're already the right names and all I need to do is change these numbers. Okay, and likewise with three. There you go. Okay, so now those actions will perform the right things, I just need to link them to their buttons. So when button one is pressed, we want to action set state one. And likewise for two and three, we're setting them to their appropriate state. Okay, so I appear to have copied the text as well. That's uh, something I've noticed. You've got to be careful when you're copying and pasting. So I had this visual element selected as well. And what it's done is it's just duplicated that as well as the button. So by deleting those, I'll now need to relink these because it was linking them to the new copied text box. So text underscore state dot text. So that's just something to be cautious of. It even catches me out from time to time. It, it just something happens. 
you'll notice you've got an extra few visual elements that weren't there before. Just delete them and uh, update the linked actions. And that shouldn't be a problem. Okay, so another thing is this text box should be on layer one as well. So something that needs to be thought about there. Okay, so we're just going to run a quick test of that and just check that updates when I press the buttons. I've got these two the wrong way around. So this is why we do our checks. So I'm going to come in, our button two, let's link to group button two, and that's why. I've named them wrong. So what I'm actually going to do is just change these to the right numbers. And I have an extra underscore here. Okay. So, apologies for that, but it just goes to show how getting the naming scheme right is very important. If you don't know what it is, you're going to be linking the wrong things together. So, here we go. Button 2 should actually be linked to group button 2, and button 3 should be linked to group button 3. Okay, and there we go. Running that again, we've got our 1, 2, and our 3. And those are going to be stored into our variable, so that when we change screen, we will have that number. So what I need to do now is on that new screen, I need to add this, and I'll keep the functionality with the buttons, and what I'll do is I'll add a timer, and I'll show you how to use that to perform several actions when the screen initially loads. So I'm going to copy across this text date. I do actually want that this time, and I'll copy buttons 1, 2, and 3, along with actions 1, 2, and 3. Okay and I'm just going to paste those straight in to this screen here. So what have we got? I've named these, interestingly, I've changed the names of these elements, which is why they haven't linked up correctly. So what we'll do now, is you'll see this is what the name was previously before I changed it, is I will just delete these again and paste them in one more time. And you should see, hmm, okay, well, moving on anyway, I'll just link them back up. It's not hard to do. So this is group button three. Okay. So our screen load is correct still. Buttons all seem to be linked to the same thing. Let me just check. So again, we have the issue here. These two are swapped. It's because I copied them and that, that is part of the template. So I want to go back and change that template later. But what I'll do for now, let's change that. There we go. Okay, and so hopefully this will now operate on the second page as well. It hasn't copied across that variable yet. So when it loads, that number is still zero. But, and once again, these are still swapped because I didn't change the links here. Okay, so just by changing these, so like I say, we really need to go back and change that template before we use it again, but I'm not going to be using it just now, and to speed things up, I'll avoid that. So what I'll do is just run that through again, check that does what it should, one, two, and three. That's exactly as we expect. So now we just need that number to be set when we change the page. So let's just check those are all correct. Yeah, so everything's fine. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use a timer in order to actually implement the onload functionality. So here we go, we've got our timer. Now what we actually want is for this to only run once and we want it to run immediately. And what I'm going to do, I don't you don't have to do this, but I tend to use a property trigger linked to that timer. And what that does is it allows us to schedule multiple actions. So normally you can do everything with one action, but if there are a couple of other things, if you want to perform several logic checks when the screen loads, this trigger is the way to do that. And so by calling that, you'll notice I don't actually link the trigger to anything. You don't need to. What it does need is a scheduled action. So what I'm going to do is create an action now which basically sets that value for me. And this is our onload action. So at the moment that trigger wasn't necessary. It's only performing one action 
but if more come at a later date, that means I don't have to change everything. I can simply schedule more in. So it's it's kind of an expandability feature, which I like to include in a lot of projects. So here we go. And what I'm doing is I'm setting the text equal to our number state when the screen loads. Now, something to be aware of is, is that that is an integer. So it should, hopefully, put it in the text box as an integer. But if it's not, and you want to control how that string appears when it converts from an integer or a number to a text value, then you use one of these string converters here. So if it doesn't work, I will show you how that happens. Oh, and I forgot, I think I need to link. No, no, we're all good. So that's only in screen one at the moment. So if I come into screen two here, and I'm going to set it to three. Ah, uh, that was screen two. So you'll notice that when I come into screen, screen two, that value is loaded. So whatever it is, come set it to two, come in here, it's two still. And so that seems to be working. What I'm going to do is just copy that and nothing else, got nothing else selected over to our screen one. There you go. Hopefully, I don't really need to change any of that. So I can just run that. Button two stays as two. One stays as one. So we're changing screens, and this variable is visible, stays the same when you move between those screens. And that's a really handy feature to have when you're using multiple screens and these variables that need to be apparent on both screens. So that's my next tip. So next, we're going to look at bar graphs from a maths builder. So this is a feature that we have had asked for a lot. So we've got our standard bar meters, our fill meters, which do all the scaling for you and, and they just scale a bar as appropriate. And what a lot of people want is to link that with the value output from say a maths builder or RS232 or anything like that. And that is a feature we are looking to add, so the ability to add or to, to link that directly to a fill meter. But in the meanwhile, just through the use of some simple maths, you can, in fact, just calculate the width of a rectangle and change it as appropriate based on the output of a maths builder. And so what I'll do is I'll just talk you through that. Um, so on this screen two here, this is where the screens start looking a bit different. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to add a rectangle. And this rectangle is going to be our bar graph. So, OK. And I'm thinking height-wise, it's a bit, a bit high. So let's try 40. And let's set that width to 300. Now, it sounds silly, but 301 is the width I tend to go for in this one. So. Why the one, I hear you asking? Well, that's because the minimum width is, in fact, one. So by doing that, the range is effectively 300. It just makes the maths a lot easier. So what I'm going to do while I'm working on this as well is just disable this background image here so that I can select things easily. So I'm going to keep it at full width just for now. So if you look at the handout handout.pdf that I've attached, that will just talk you through the equation I'm, I'm using. It's just y equals mx plus c, uh, standard linear representation. So if you're, if you're doing something a bit more complicated and, and are looking for a non-linear response, then that's fine. But I'm, in this case, I'm simply going to do a math builder that calculates the linear width change based on a linear uh, input voltage change. And so what we're going to use is in fact these two inputs. Now I've specified them as 0 to 10. In my workings I've used minus 5 to 5 because I was working on the dev board, but uh, for this just the, the maths is the same. Uh, in fact I'll, I'll do minus 5 to 5 just to keep it consistent. So what I'll do is I'll just change those input ranges. Okay, and the first thing we want to do is calculate or, or work out the equation. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with y equals mx plus c. 
but basically we're saying that y is the width, we're trying to get the width by multiplying the, uh, the, the in this case we're going to look at the sum of the two analog inputs, so by multiplying the sum of those voltages by a factor m and then applying an offset of c, that will give us the correct width. So we're looking to calculate those values of m and c. So just working my way through the uh, the equations I've shown you, we're, it, we're calculating m by looking at our our, um, our slope, so the change in width divided by the change in voltage. So at maximum width, we're at 301, and at minimum width, we're at 1. So our change in width is 300 over that range. Likewise, maximum voltage is going to be it's going to be plus 10 because we've got plus 5 from one input added to plus 5 from another input and the minimum is going to be minus 10. So you can see I've just taken one divided by the other and that gives me a slope of 15. So that means our M value is going to be 15. Now looking at the C value, we simply plug in that M value and two known values for the width and the voltage and we can calculate what that offset is. So you can see I've performed that equation there and it gives us an offset of 151. So we know our equation for calculating the width is going to be sum of voltage times by 15 added to 151. So what I'm going to do is actually put that in now. So I'm going to create a mass builder. So this first one is going to give me the value of the sum and that is simply going to be one voltage added to the other. Okay, and that. So I, I think I mentioned, but there is a handout. It's worth just checking that. Um, it, it quite clearly explains what I've done in the maths. Just might make things a bit easier. And also, you can go away and take a look at it afterwards if you're not sure what you're doing. So okay, so here's our sum. So this this maths builder will give us the value of the summed voltages, the analog input. And so using that, we're going to create another one that will give us the width of this rectangle so actually I'm going to specify a bit more in that so it's the bar width where this is our bar okay and so that is going to be using the equation we just derived so we've got our sum value so value underscore sum where are you there you are dot value multiplied by our m value which is 15 as we've worked out so these m and c values will change but the basic structure of this creating a width it also applies to rotating needles so instead of width you could fill in the rotation positions and you could calculate the same thing and you could have a rotating bar graph um, so really anything can be used so what I'm going to do then is add the offset we calculated earlier which we calculate as 151. Okay, and that is our equation. So that at all times should have the value of our bar width. And so what I want to do now is update that bar width. So what I could do is I could, in theory, use a property trigger. So whenever the input values change, I could update that bar. Now, as I said earlier, I find that that tends to flicker, it tends to look a bit unsteady. I think it's neater to use a timer for anything analog. So what I'm going to do is use a timer, which I'm going to update half a second. Um, let's call it timer underscore bar update. <clears throat> and what that's going to do is run every 500 milliseconds. And when the screen is loaded first, so the start layer is going to be zero. And it's going to set that bar. So we need an action that sets the bar width. Just keep that naming consistent. There we go. So that timer there is going to call that action, and it's going to run every 500 milliseconds. So 
here we go, and all that's going to do is set the width property of our bar, so rectangle, and it's a bar, and the width property is down here, equal to the calculated value of that mass builder, so we're looking for our value bar width, and there we have it. So what I'll do now is I'll just run that example, and if we come over onto the bar screen, now you'll notice these are set to 0 and 10 at the moment, and I've set this up for between minus 5 and 5. So that's why we're seeing a bar in the middle, because these values are technically in the middle. Here we go. Okay, so now if I update this, half a second later, that's going to update, well, not necessarily half a second later, but there's a half second gap between its updating periods. So there you go. That seems to work as expected. So there's your bar graph. Uh, just to show you it can go a little bit faster if that doesn't look fast enough for you, let's just set this timer down to 100 milliseconds. Here we go, so that may just update a little quicker. Um, once again it's, it's 0 and 10. One second, I'm on the wrong screen. So here you go, so you can see that that's updating a lot more regularly now. So it, you can change it around to whatever your customer or you require, whatever you think looks nice, or you could use a property trigger and that will give you almost instantaneous response to any changes, but as I say it will be more processor intensive. So in large projects maybe think about whether you actually need to be showing something instantaneously and whether the smallest change really needs an update, that's, that's entirely up to you. Okay, so that's it for bar graphs from Maths Builders. So next, I'm going to talk you through the basics of RS-232, because this is one of the features we've added, but we haven't got quite as much documentation out there as we'd like, and there's a lot of people looking to use RS-232. So hopefully this will give you a quick rundown of, of what all the properties do and how to use it. I don't have an RS-232 device set up here, so I won't be able to show you it working, but hopefully you'll be able to try it out on your end and get it working without any problems. So here we go, RS-232, I'm going to add it to this screen, I'm not actually going to add it because of demo purposes and I don't have it connected, but what I'll do is I'll add the elements, so the three main elements are our RS-232 receive, RS-232 send, and our serial COM port. There are a couple of others, like this error handler here, but for this, I'm gonna I'm gonna ignore that. I don't think it it it's that necessary for this. So let's start by looking at the hardware element. This is kind of the core of your RS232. So you can think of this as the physical connection. We're looking at things like the board rate parity stop bit flow control. Now, if you're talking to a panel pilot ace you'll see there's a service type here. So panel pilot ace to panel pilot ace communication comes under native. Basically anything else, I'd, I'd suggest machine to machine, you're looking at terminal. If you're plugging it into your computer and talking to it through TerraTerm, again, you're looking at terminal use. So really native is just panel pilot ace to panel pilot ace. So board rate and parity, stop bits and flow control, you should know what your target is set up as. If you're using this as a master device, then you should likewise know what you want it to be set as. Um, these are a very simple standard RS-232 settings, so um, if you have any questions on these, you can always ask them, uh, or you could Google them. They're, they're, there's plenty of information out there on what these are, and any data sheet will tell you of the device you're connecting to what is required. Most PCs can handle any of these settings if you're using a USB to RS-232 converter, so don't worry about it too much, I would just leave them as default unless you know it needs to be different. So terminal mode is something else to look at, so your single raw data, this is basically telling it that it doesn't want any any pretty wrapping around it so that if a, if a user is looking at it, you know, that's when you're looking at these prompts that what that's doing is it's adding a little prompt which shows what you've done, where the code, or where the terminal is currently at. It just makes it look nice. If you're talking machine to machine, you don't want any of that. You're going to want to use single raw data, multiple raw data, depending on how much information you're sending. 
Uh, and if, if you're talking to a user on, say, TerraTerm or a terminal application on your PC, you probably want to use the prompts. It just makes it look a little neater. You can actually see what you're typing. Very useful for stuff like that. Okay. So next we have, let me just put in multiple so we can see all of these options. So we've got the send and receive terminators. So what they are is they are the characters that it is expecting or it's going to put at the end of one RS-232 send or receive function. So for example, we're sending each analog input's voltage value over RS-232. What we're going to do is we're going to send, um, if we're sending, we're going to send the first value followed by the second value, uh, sorry, followed by a separator, followed by the second value, followed by the terminator. So this send terminator here. So if we've got a separator of space, we'll send value one, space, value two, and then we'll send the terminator. Likewise with the receive, I'll talk you through it a bit more in a second, but basically these are what goes on the end and what goes in between the values. Okay, so moving on to the send and receive themselves. The send element here, you specify the serial port. That's pretty standard. Oh, sorry, this is received. Let's let's start on send. You specify the serial port, and then you just specify all of the values you want to send. And these will be separated out by the specified separator. And also, you can add a message that goes before the value, a message that goes after the value. And at the very end, it'll put the terminator. Okay, so moving on to the receive function. Now, the thing that is important to note about the receive is the alias. So when you receive something, you need a clear identifier at the beginning before it receives a separator which identifies which function to call. So by default, that will be equal to the name of your receive function uh, element. However, you can specify now an alias which removes the limitations of names. So you'll notice names can't have certain characters, can't be certain lengths an alias can be, so it just removes that limitation. And then once it's received the alias, it receives the separator, followed by any number of values and further separators. And at the end, you should have a terminator. And then you've got this action element here, which allows you to call an action when the function is received. So if I put all of my received data into variables, and then I want to do something with those variables at the end, I can put the action that does it in there. Okay. So, just a couple more things. I'm going to show you about element relationships. Now, this is a really handy tip that isn't commonly known, and it, it really helps in a large project to work out where everything is. So, what I'm just going to do, I'm just going to get rid of those serial elements. So, <clears throat> for example, I'm not sure why my buttons aren't working. Well, what I can do is actually right-click up the top here, and show element relationships. And so I'm curious as to why, in particular, actually let's look at the alarms. I want to know why those alarms aren't coming on when they should. So I don't have alarms on the screen. I'm going to come to it on here. I can select this alarm, and what that's doing is it's showing me any elements that have an effect on that alarm. And so I can see here, there's only one thing that changes the state of that alarm. So if there's something wrong with it, that's where that problem has to come from. So if I want to now look at everything linked to a function element, I just select the function element at the top here. And what I can see is this is actually linked directly to these two control elements here. And it's also linked to these Boolean elements here. So that just helps me debug. I'm looking, OK, actually, that's probably where the error is then if it's in one of these conditions. So that's just a really handy tip. And you can use it if you're coming into someone else's project, if you're coming to an example project, to just see how that project is mapped out and how, how the interactions between the functional and visual and hardware all occur. So finally, we're going to look at the custom splash screen. Now, this is a feature that a lot of people, again, have asked for. And the feature has been there pretty much the whole time the Panel Pilot Ace Design Studio has been there but it's just not been that obvious how to do it. And so what I want to do is I want to right click up here. So you'll see I've got a device connected. This won't be here if you don't have a device connected. But once it is, you can click on your device configuration 
and you can actually set the splash screen at the bottom here. Now there's a couple of other features. Setting the device name is a new one that's very handy. If you have multiple devices and you want to clearly identify them, you could actually give it a name so that when it plugs in, it'll say up here what, what it's called. Uh, you've got the real-time clock. What I want to do is uh, select a splash screen. So I can do that by opening this up and I've actually got to navigate to where this is stored. So one second. One second here. Should be somewhere in here. Um, one second. Sorry about the wait here. We have a lovely image ready to go and just need to find it. Okay. We're just going to use some easy log general publicity here. Um, so it'll automatically resize it to 48 by 272, but I'd really recommend that you actually create the image to the right size. So for those of you who weren't aware, the screen size is 480 by 272, and any images for it, if you don't want to see it looking a bit scaled, then I would recommend that. So I've selected this image, and what I can do is just hit that configure button now. So hopefully what you'll see, if I start showing you the device I've got connected, if I just now reboot that, Okay, so that's turned off. You see it's disconnected at the top here. And where are we? There you go. So there's our wonderful new splash screen on the device. You'll have to excuse the reflection of the webcam. Um, and yeah, so there you go. You've got your new splash screen ready to go.